Hey everyone, um, I'm Arthur Miller with Ingram Micro Specialty Solutions Group. Today we are discussing future technology trends in logistics and retail. I'm very excited to be joined by two very special guests. Uh, thank you to our two subject matter experts. We have Mark Disowns on behalf of Honeywell and John Didding on behalf of Samsung. Uh, so first, um, you know, we'll start with you, Mark, uh, and then kind of finish it off with John. Um, Mark, uh, we all know the logistics industry is undergoing a massive transformation um, due to advances in new innovative technologies. Warehousing is a big part of logistics. Um, the growing trend of robotics is something that Ingram Micro Technology integrators and their end customers are asking about more and more frequently. I was wondering if you could share some thoughts around robotics in the warehouse. Sure. Uh, before I, uh, I get going, just a couple of things to sort of set the stage uh, for this conversation is that um, I saw something the other day from the U.S. Labor Department that said there's going to be a 5.5 million person gap between job openings in the domestic supply chain and available people. And so that's a huge gap we got to fill over the next uh, next couple of years. And that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of focus on robotics now. Um, I'm sure we all sort of, some people poked at that Gartner report that just came out, says that 75% of companies uh, by 2027 will have uh, some form, and they call it cyber physical automation in the warehouse. And they also said that 98% of the folks that they're talking to are either currently investing or planning to invest in robotic solutions in the next two years. And so people are thinking robotics will help them with this $5.5 million gap. And so when you start talking about robotics specifically, it can get really confusing. Uh, if any anyone went to ProMap, there's a million different robot companies out there. So in my mind, I'm trying to compartmentalize them into different types of robots. So the, the, the first that's starting to gain a little bit of traction in the warehouse are mobile robots that bring goods to people. Uh, as you know, travel time is one of the biggest uh, productivity drains in a warehouse. The more you can eliminate uh, an employee's travel time, the more you're gonna improve productivity. Uh, so what these mobile robots do is they bring goods to people. And the nice thing about this solution is that you don't have to rearrange your warehouse. You just gotta get some special shelves uh shelving and uh then the robots and then um, you can potentially start um, improving productivity with the folks that you have um, there's also sort of a subcategory of these goods to people robots uh, robotic cube storage systems which uh, i've seen in warehouses those are much more complex accomplish the same thing but it's basically a dedicated section of the warehouse that has this infrastructure that's dedicated to bringing goods to people so that's one type of robot uh, another type are simply robots that simply just move stuff. They're sort of a autonomous uh, mobile robots, I guess is what you would call them. And they're basically the natural evolution of automated guided vehicles. Uh, they're really being used mostly uh, in lieu of an individual driving a four truck uh, for pallet moves um, and unloading trucks. So that's another category of robot. There's also collaborative mobile robots, which are used with employees. So they would either uh, for example, um, there would be robots in a picking aisle that are waiting for an employee to come up to them and pick a particular product and put it in a basket and the robot takes off and takes it to the next picking location, minimizing the amount of walking that the employee has to do. That's another type of robot that people are starting to explore. There's also mobile sortation robots. Um, they could potentially, I see those being most effective if you're building a new warehouse um, they can be used potentially as an alternative to conventional uh, conventional conveyor sortation they're flexible um, um, but uh, again and finally well not again uh, they're flexible i'm not 100 percent sure on the price of those things and so uh, i won't comment on that and finally the sort of the, the holy grail of robots is a warehouse picking robot when, when someone figures this out and there are a ton of companies that are trying, uh, it's gonna tra transform warehouses. Uh, in manufacturing, they have these robots that are doing very specific, consistent, repetitive tasks. Warehouse picking isn't that simple. There's a lot of variables involved, so that's why they're having trouble solving for that. Now, 
it's one thing to have a robot. It's another thing to, to link that robot to your WMS system. So the software that's going to be that, that's going to be driving these robots and then taking that information and, 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 and uh, bring it to your WMS, that's where it also gets tricky. Again, there's just a ton of different companies uh, that are in the robotic space, a ton of different solutions. Uh, it's almost overwhelming at this point. And um, I know it's coming, I'm just not sure when. Wow, yeah, I mean, that, that sounds really great. You know, um, I, you know, I can't believe those, those use cases. Um, you know, and as you just mentioned, it, it can be complex. There's always a little bit more to the you know, to the project than initially meets the eye. So, figuring out a, a scope of work, right? It's it's definitely you know, uh, you know, an onerous kind of process. Um, so, with all, well, that said, you know, you know, on the other hand, you know, um, some of these warehouses might not really be ready to move just yet. They might not be ready to move to robotics. What if they are ready to jump into robotics? What would you suggest to them as some options? Yeah, and, and that's definitely true. There are definitely plenty of warehouses that aren't quite ready to make the leap. Uh, and to be honest with you, I don't know if the robotics companies are ready for them to make the leap. So in the meantime, two technologies that are really hot are voice and wearables. When I say voice, I mean using voice to drive applications. So if you had someone, for example, that was doing a picking application, instead of having to interact with a, uh, a typical handheld device, You've got a headset on that's connected to a terminal that could potentially be on a belt that's driving you through the application. So you're just having a conversation with the application via voice and not having to interact with any sort of uh, other device. And that there's a significant increase in productivity with these types of applications. And there's also wearables. And when I say wearables, uh, yes, voice is a wearable, but I'm talking about using wearables in traditional applications that may or may not be driven by voice uh, where you would wear a terminal uh, on your arm, uh, potentially, and then if you needed to scan, you could wear a scanner on your hand. And an example of how that improves productivity is that, let's pretend this is a typical uh, handheld device in a typical warehouse application, and I'm building a pallet. So what would happen is I would get a, a look at my, my, my terminal, it would say, go to a location, whatever. I'd go to that location, I would scan a location barcode, and then it would say, pick by, I would traditionally scan a product barcode and type in five. And then to actually take those boxes and put them on a pallet, I got to do something with this. So I'm either going to put it in my arm, put it in a holster, put it down, uh, and then I start picking. And that little extra step there can be five, six seconds per task. And that adds up. Now with wearables, say I've got this device uh, and it's the right wearable and I've got it on my arm. And then I've got a scanner on my finger. I go and it says go to a particular location. I go to that location, I scan that location barcode. It says pick five, I scan a product barcode and then immediately start picking. I don't have to monkey around with the handheld device. It's all there, it stays on my body. I don't put it down, I don't have to put it in a holster, I don't have to put it in my arm and I'm off to the races. And uh, we're seeing about six seconds savings per task with wearable technology. So those are two that I think uh, can help bridge that gap while you're trying to figure out your robotic strategy. You could, you could wear it on your hand, right, as a ring. I think I've seen those before. And like you said, you could wear it on your wrist. Um, I've even seen some, you know, some newer technology where it's kind of a, a set of glasses. Um, you're speaking of kind of futuristic uh, technology, um, you know, just one last little poke at autonomous robots. Lately, we've been hearing a lot about uh, the use of drones in warehouses. Uh, you know, what are your quick thoughts on drones? Have, have you seen, um, you know, people adopting them and, and how? I mean, those things, there was a lot of hype at first. Uh, and I think there's going to be room for them for things like cycle counting, but it's only for full pallets. Uh, I also, uh, um, they can be used for what I call locationing. So determining whether a, a location is empty or full. They aren't good at counting boxes. And of course, they're not going to be good at counting individual items. And so it's really going to be limited how they're used. Uh, and I've also heard some rumblings that battery life is short on those things, 20 to 30 minutes. So um, not how, um, uh, until they can conquer that, that's going to also be a limiting factor for drones. Right. And I've, I've seen some of these, um, you know, these uh, situations where both robotics and, you know, even drones could be used, um, or at least, um, you know, scope of works and things like that that have come up. And the connectivity is always a really big deal, I, I think, because of the speeds at which these things are moving around. Wi-Fi typically can't handle, you know, these these types of environments. So, uh, you know, you know, what what are your thoughts on overcoming the connectivity issues? Uh, I heard some things about five G. Are, are there any 
Have any thoughts on that, Mark? Yeah, um, there's been a ton of hype and even confusion about 5G. Uh, everyone knows about it, but when you, we just got off the road, we did a bunch of road shows and we asked all the, the people that were there, who knows about 5G? And you know, most people would raise their hand. Who's actually doing something with 5G? And no one would raise their hand. And so it's more hype right now, but I think 5G is eventually going to be an important part of, uh, of the warehouse of DC. Right now it's, it's all Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is de facto. Uh, but when you think about 5G, there's really two different types of 5G. Let me get this off my screen. Uh, there's carrier supported 5G, uh, which uses the public 5G networks, I mean, which uses the public cellular network, but there's also self-maintained private 5G networks where the customer licenses their own spectrum uh, for their own private use. And a lot of people don't know that. They don't separate the two. They think everything, they think 5G, they think carriers, they think big public network. That's not necessarily the case. And for the warehouse and DC space, there's some advantages to this private 5G networks. Um, both can help, both the carrier supported and the private and, and the right use case. Private um, is better than public when coverage is lacking. You know, if you're out in the country somewhere and you got a warehouse and there's not a lot of cell coverage, uh, having a 5G network that, that works off the public network isn't going to help you much. And so that's one advantage of a private network. Also, if the customer wants to maintain control of their data, that's where private 5G networks uh, come into play. Nooks and crannies, right? Get, getting at those nooks and crannies. Yeah, and I don't think 5G is going to replace Wi-Fi. Uh, it's just going to cover use cases where Wi-Fi doesn't do so well, like you just said. A, a blended network, you know, of, of, of multiple connectivity. Potentially, yeah. Or in, in, in big yards and mining facilities, energy manufacturing, those are some of the, the industries that could take advantage of 5G. Now, I, I get asked a lot, 5G versus Wi-Fi 6. Uh, I think that's something we need to cover real quick. If you don't mind, you mind if I talk about that for sure. a second? Oh, yeah, sure. Go, go ahead. Really, Wi-Fi uh, 6, there, there's an interesting article by McKinsey that sort of explains the differences between the two, and there's some really good charts. Uh, but what I got from it mostly was that you're going to find better speeds with Wi-Fi 6, uh, but everything else, it feels like it leans towards 5G. And so you're going to get better range with the 5G private network. You're going to get better latency and reliability. Uh, we've got an engineer that calls it the six nines. That may be a common engineering term. So it's 99.9999% uh, 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 reliability. That's five, five minutes downtime in a given year. Uh, and like you said a second ago, 5G is going to work a little bit better in environments where there are metal obstructions. But I think the most interesting thing about 5G is the number of connections compared to Wi-Fi. Uh, so if you take a, a, a typical million square foot warehouse, you could potentially have 100,000 devices transmitting at the same time in that uh, million square foot warehouse. Whereas you think about a Wi-Fi access point, a Wi-Fi 6 access point, it supports eight transmitting at the same time. And so think sensors. When, when sensors are all over the warehouse and um, driving a lot of uh, the activity and you have thousands of them in a warehouse, that I mean, they could potentially drive five G support into into smaller uh, companies and, and industries where it's currently not being looked at. Right, right, yeah, lots and lots of data. Um, well, that was great. You know, th thanks again, Mark. Uh, thanks again, Honeywell. Appreciate that. Um, just to kind of flip it around, we we all know, right, why warehousing and logistics are innovating. It's due to strains on supply chains. Uh, Obviously, we all know due to increases in custom consumer demands and expectations. So, you know, what happens once the warehouse items are delivered in the store? Uh, you know, how are consumers benefiting from these shifts in technology? We have John Didick here on behalf of Samsung to help us understand uh, some of these uh, some of these new things that are coming up. And, and John, could you take a minute to introduce yourself and then we can get in some of the payment side of the, the retail ramp, uh, landscape? Thanks, John. Yeah, thank you, author. Uh, John Dittig, Senior Business Development Leader for Samsung, based in Atlanta. I'm primarily focused on self-service and kiosks, but also uh, well-versed in all types of, of payments, uh, whether it be uh, cash, credit, or of course, we're going to be talking uh, crypto on this podcast. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, just was reading the other day that some of the stores are now offering to take cryptocurrency as payment. Um, but first I wonder maybe if you could just kind of 
back us up a bit, if you could help us kind of level set, what is cryptocurrency and how does it work? Yeah, it's a it's it's a great question. And you know, crypto came out back in two thousand nine, and the first type of of crypto was uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of it was called uh, Bitcoin. But basically, what cryptocurrency is, it's a digital or virtual currency, and it's secured by what's called a cryptograph, which makes it nearly impossible to counterfeit or or have any type of, of double spend. Um, it's all um, app based. And, you know, I'm sure if you have your your Galaxy uh, phone, uh, when you make a payment um, on the app, on on if you're using our kiosk, you can do it on a scanner. Um, and the nice thing about crypto is the payment is automatic. We're typically with credit cards. Uh, once it's approved, there's a, a process that it goes through 24 hours. But with crypto, the payment is immediate. So once you make the payment on your phone via the app, it automatically goes to the to the merchant that is accepting it. The other thing about crypto, it's really kind of it exists on a on a decentralized network using blockchain. And there's a lot of different types of crypto, uh, which I'm sure we're going to get into. The most um, frequent uh, that you have heard out there is Bitcoin. There's another one called uh, Ethereum. Uh, but there are many, many different cur uh, currencies that are out there in the market today. And for the reseller partners that are wanting to get involved with this, I would definitely do my homework uh, because um, you, you don't want to come up with another FTX, uh, which obviously turned out to be a, a Ponzi scheme. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and some of the other payment uh, processes are not like FTX. Uh, so we, I know we're going to get into some of the other payment factors uh, here with you, Arthur, here in a few. Yeah. And, and you know, sure, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, we don't want to you know necessarily mention people that we, we should avoid because we never really know what the future holds. But, you know, you know, other than um, two that you'd mentioned, are there a couple others to kind of be on the lookout for? And then to follow that up, um, do banks back, back these cryptocurrencies? Yeah, so there, there's many that are out there. The most prevalent uh, used are, are Bitcoin um, and a company called Ethereum. And, and when you invest in them, you're basically paying cash uh, as a cash transaction into these um, different currencies. And then you get a dollar value just like you do a U.S. currency. So these currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies trade on a daily uh, basis uh, and they can either go up or down uh, considering uh, the value just similar to like a, a, a dollar. Um, and so when it comes to the banks, the answer is yes. Some banks have, have backed crypto and have a form of payment and others have kind of uh, shied away. I think kind of like the... Um, the early industry of the car business or Arthur, if you're old enough, the first, um, uh, you know, the PC business, when you go back to, you know, HP and Dell survived all the shakeouts, right? In the early days of PCs, you had Compaq, you had um, ALR, you had all these different white box companies that came about and some of them either went away because their business model didn't sustain or they got bought out through acquisition. And I think you're going to kind of see the same thing, you know, with crypto play out here over the next uh, decade or so. Yeah, it's so interesting. Uh, you know, even see them uh, just the uh, kind of the different types of market markets that I follow or maybe the TV, TV show like a Bloomberg. You know, you start to see reports on what, what they're trading at. It's really pretty interesting. Um, so bring it back home. Um, we have lots of partners who integrate and sell technology here um, at Ingram Micro. Um, you know, we, you know, you guys are a very valuable partner of ours. What can, what can our partners do to maybe be ready for some of this technology as it starts to emerge? Uh, do today's payment devices accept crypto, um, self-service situations, mobile phone? Just, just wondering how we can, you know, help our partners understand what the, what the benefit here to them might be. Yeah. So for, for all of your partners, I would highly recommend they do a lot of homework uh, before they pick a partner or a type of currency. Um, there are some ones that are out there that are much more established like Bitcoin and Ethereum. As I mentioned, there's another color company I hear a lot about called Ripple. 
Uh, but in terms of the payment, it is app based. And so what you can do is it's app to app on your phone, or if you have a scanner um, that actually takes payments, some credit card terminals now actually do um, take uh, crypto payments. Um, and so we have a couple of reseller partners that do quite a bit of crypto. And what we're seeing, um, where we're seeing crypto the most prevalent is in the entertainment industry where the nightclub industries uh, are taking crypto quite a bit. And then the other thing you want to make sure of is that in the U.S., there's their own bylaws when it comes to crypto. Mexico has laws and then Europe has laws. So whatever you're investing in and whatever market you are venturing into, you want to make sure that you know the laws for every single country. Uh, and if you're U.S. based, uh, you can Google them and get them online. Uh, you can also uh, Google what types of currencies are out there because there's literally hundreds, right? And every single one has a value. Um, my word of advice is stick with the ones that seem to be the most stable and have been around for a while because those are the ones that a lot of people are investing in, like an Ethereum or a Bitcoin. And again, just like the dollar, it fluctuates every day. So the currency is going to go up and down depending on the amount of um, income coming into each cryptocurrency in the amount of money that's coming out, just like the U.S. dollar on a daily basis. Yeah, wow. It's an uh, interesting new world. Like, uh, can't wait to see how things uh, evolve from it. So, yeah, thanks again, John. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks again, Mark. We really learned a lot from both of your insights. Everyone watching, please reach out to your Ingram Micro sales executive. Uh, we can get you more information on some of these topics. We can get you in touch with our subject matter experts. And please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button below to get more great content. Thanks again.